Hello, my name is David Mongan. I'm a psychiatry trainee in Northern Ireland and today I'd like to talk about schizophrenia. There's a commonly held misconception that schizophrenia refers to a split personality, but that's simply not true. That doesn't happen in schizophrenia. Similarly, schizophrenia isn't just a byword for violence, which is sometimes portrayed in the media in that way and with the use of negative imagery. However, it's actually a fact that most patients with schizophrenia are more likely to be victims of crime and victims of violence than they are to be perpetrators themselves. Um, it's also, uh, there's also an idea that schizophrenia is untreatable and the patients are simply locked away. Again, that's completely untrue. Um, most patients with schizophrenia function in their home environments in the community and can fulfil lasting relationships and, and employment. Um, and respond very well to treatments, which I'll go on to explain later. I'd like to talk about now about how common schizophrenia is. Um, it is extraordinarily common. There's also the concept of risk of schizophrenia. This is the likelihood of somebody developing it over the course of their lifetime. We call this the lifetime risk of the disorder. And studies have shown that the lifetime risk is about one in a hundred. So out of a hundred people, one of those people is likely to develop it at some point in their lives. So again, very common. The symptoms can be divided up into positive symptoms and negative symptoms. And when we talk about positive and negative, I don't mean in the traditional sense of being good and bad. What I mean here is that the positive symptoms are what the disorder adds and the negative symptoms are what the disorder takes away. So the positive symptoms tend to be unusual experiences. And these include things like hallucinations. Hallucinations occur when there is a perception in the absence of a stimulus. So what I mean by that is, for example, hearing a voice when there isn't a voice actually there or seeing something when there isn't anything there to see. Now, the hallucinations which occur are very real. So to take the auditory hallucinations, which are the voices, as an example, these aren't just the voice that we all hear inside our head, our thoughts. This, these voices are, sound extremely real, as real as my voice does right now. The patient may hunt out around their house to see where the voice is coming from, and the voice, there may be one of these voices, there may be more than one. Sometimes they talk amongst themselves or, and say nasty or derogatory things about the patient or their loved ones. Again, you can imagine how scary that must be um, for patients who are hearing these voices. Then there are delusions. Delusions are fixed false beliefs out of keeping with somebody's cultural background. So, for example, the patient might feel that there is a, an external agency or an external organisation coming after them. These are called persecutory delusions. And these delusions, they're, they're not just fleeting ideas that come and go. They are held with 100% conviction. So the patient is as sure that, the, that there's somebody coming after them. They're as sure as that as they are that the sky is blue. Then there are ideas of reference. These occur when the patient feels that um, things going on in the environment are referring to them. So for example, listening to the news, they might feel that the news story is directly referring to themselves. Then there are feelings of being controlled. We call these passivity phenomena. So the patient might feel that some external agency is controlling them, controlling their body, their thoughts. Again, very scary. And lastly, thought disorder. Thought disorder occurs when the patient's normal train of thought, which usually progresses in a logical way, is disrupted suddenly and they jump on to a completely different topic which can affect their even their speech and how they think about things so very difficult for patients to cope with you can imagine how it would interfere with schooling and getting a job and employment and often these positive symptoms occur early in the disorder and the onset of schizophrenia is often in teenage years early 20s or 30s when a lot of patients will be perhaps um, getting qualifications going to university or courses or college looking to get employment so it can have a really severe disruption in the lives of these patients. Then there are negative symptoms. Now the negative symptoms are symptoms of, that the disorder um, causes where there's a reduction in something, the disorder takes away something. Um, so these could be for example reduced motivation or lack of drive. Um, the patient might appear quite apathetic, they're just they're not interested in things that they normally would have been and that can be interpreted by some as laziness, but it's not. It's very much a part of the condition that needs its own treatment and its own supports. There may be poor self-care on, on the part of the patient, or they might feel that they have a lot of difficulty concentrating and completing tasks they normally would. The negative symptoms tend to occur later on in the disorder, 
Um, and whereas the positive symptoms occur early and generally respond very well to treatment, the negative symptoms often take a lot longer to respond and are the more disabling. So we've talked about what schizophrenia is, we've talked about the positive symptoms and the negative symptoms, positive being the delusions and hallucinations, negative symptoms being the disorder takes away, so reduced motivation, lack of drive and so on. I've talked about how common schizophrenia is, now let's talk about the causes of the condition. So what causes schizophrenia? It's likely that there's lots and lots of different causes, all of which have small increases in risk associated with them. So there's not one single particular big cause, but all of these different factors when taken together increase the risk of the likelihood of the disorder occurring. And I'd like to talk about each of these in turn. We'll talk first about the genetic factors. That refers to the DNA, the the genetic material that we inherit from our mothers and fathers, what makes us us. There's certain abnormalities, abnormalities there that I'd like to talk about. Then I'd like to then moving on from the DNA, I'd like to talk about the development of the human being and how in different abnormalities at that stage can also increase the risk. We know that schizophrenia itself is a disorder of the brain. So there are abnormalities of the structure of the brain and its functioning. That I'd like to talk about in terms of its chemistry as well as its structure and then I'll finish by talking about the life events or life stressors that can contribute to risk as well as focusing on drug misuse. So how do we know that genetic factors or DNA is important? Well I've mentioned already that the lifetime risk of anybody in the population developing schizophrenia is about one in a hundred. However if you have one parent who's affected by the condition so you share some of their DNA then the risk is 1 in 10, it's up by a factor of 10. If you share even more DNA with somebody who has schizophrenia, so say for example you have a non-identical twin affected, then the risk is 1 in 8, whereas if you share the exact same DNA, so an identical twin, then your risk is 1 in 2, 50% risk. So there's a huge element of genetic factors involved with the development of schizophrenia at later stage. And scientists have identified a number of different genes that can contribute to the condition. Genes such, and genes refer to stretches of DNA where there may be abnormalities that can increase the risk. These include neuregulin, dysbindin, and the disrupted in schizophrenia gene, or DISC. Moving on from the genetic factors, I'd like to talk now about the developmental factors. So abnormalities in how a child or a human being develops. You can think of these as dividing them up into factors before birth, factors during birth and factors after birth. Concentrating on pre-birth um, factors. Again, there are studies have shown that um, there can be abnormalities in the developing embryo, even at that level, even that early on um, in certain patients with schizophrenia. And the research seems to show that it could be due to how the um, nerve cells connect up and I'll go, come on to talk about that later. There are also abnormalities of the birth itself, the birth process itself. Now these include things like obstetric complications. These can increase the risk of schizophrenia. And I'd like to point out at this stage that it's not that any one factor is, definite, is a definite cause of schizophrenia um, or means that the baby or child will definitely develop schizophrenia at a later stage. It's more that th there's a slight increase in the risk or the likelihood of the developing of the um, condition developing later on. Then what about factors after the birth? These would include things like childhood brain conditions, head injury or encephalitis for example, which is inflammation of the brain. These can influence the risk as well. I've referred to this already but there's an emerging concept in um, neuroscience at the moment is the idea that um, schizophrenia might be caused by an excess of um, synaptic pruning. Now I'll come on to explain what that is. Um, and I'd like to explain it through the use of um, this picture of a tree. So imagine you have been shrunk down to a tiny, tiny microscopic level and you're sitting at the bottom of a nerve cell and you're looking all the way up and up towards the top of the tree you can see the nerve cell branching off um, and connecting with lots of other different nerve cells, tens of thousands of connections up there. And the, the nerve cells are communicating with each other, sending messages back and forth, back and forth, all over the place. Now, the brain connects, or the nerve cells are connected between each other by connections called synapses. 
and the rate of formation of these connections is greatest within the first two years of life because the baby is maturing and learning about itself and its environment so the brain is adapting to all of that and increasing the number of connections. Then as we get older into our teenage and eventually adult years we prune off the uh, synaptic connections that we just don't need anymore. So you can think of like a gardener pruning off a, a tree or a bush. Um, however in schizophrenia it seems that there's an excess of this pruning with the result that there's not as many connections between the nerve cells. So parts of the brain just don't talk to each other as best as they might have done before. That leads us on nicely to talk about brain structure itself and there is evidence that, there's an abnormal, that there are abnormalities of the brain structure in patients with schizophrenia on average. So for example um, when studies are done doing brain scanning we can find abnormalities there. There's a reduced volume of, of the brain tissue itself. Um, there's also enlargement of the spaces in the middle of the brain, the ventricles, which is where cerebrospinal fluid is produced. Um, we can do te techniques to measure the electrical activity of the brain and pick up abnormalities in patients with schizophrenia. And lastly, uh, there, when we look under the microscope, we can see altered microscopic structure of individual cells as well. It's not just the structure of the brain, it's as I've alluded to already, it's also how the brain communicates within itself. And as, as I've, talked, I've talked already about synapses, at synapses um, the brain uses chemicals, um, chemical messengers um, to communicate between nerve cells. And one of these chemicals that seems to be important in schizophrenia is dopamine. Um, science shows that there's probably an excess of dopamine in certain parts of the brain in people with schizophrenia. And we know this, for example, because um, certain street drugs such as amphetamines can increase dopamine and cause schizophrenic symptoms. Similarly when um, we give patients um, dopamine, so for example patients with Parkinson's disease, that's a condition where there's too little dopamine. When doctors give um, those patients dopamine, um, if we over treat them and give too much then that can cause side effects which are very similar to schizophrenic symptoms, those positive symptoms, the delusions and hallucinations that we've already talked about. Lastly Antipsychotics, which are the mainstay of medications in schizophrenia, um, these tend to work by reducing the levels of dopamine and we know that they're definitely effective in alleviating some of the symptoms of the disorder. So it seems to be that there's too much dopamine in certain areas of the brain in people with schizophrenia. It's not all just about chemicals and brain structure though. Life events and life stressors are important. Studies have shown that there are more people with schizophrenia living in urban areas as opposed to rural and this might be because um, of the stress of urban living. Um, we also know that there are more adverse events in a patient's life prior to the onset of a relapse. So for example a bereavement um, in the patient's family or um, a different life stressor going on. Um, and these all increase the risk of relapses of the condition occurring. So the last factor I'm going to talk about is drug misuse. Um, as I've said already, amphetamines, um, which are street drugs um, such as speed, these can increase the, um, the risk of schizophrenic symptoms occurring. But generally, once those drugs are stopped, the symptoms go away. However, there, there is evidence that in taking regular and heavy use of cannabis, particularly in those early years, the teenage years, as the brain is maturing, can increase the risk of developing schizophrenia at a later point. So to summarise this section, what we've talked about is the overall risk of schizophrenia which is likely contributed to by lots and lots of different um, smaller factors but when taken together and all added together they probably increase the risk of the disorder at a later stage. We have talked about um, genes and genetic material how that influences your risk as well as developmental factors pre-birth, during birth and after birth. We've talked about um, abnormalities of brain structure and its function in terms of brain chemistry and including dopamine as well as life events and life stressors and look, look, we look particularly at the issue of drug misuse. So now I'd like to talk about how we treat schizophrenia and as with everything in, everything in psychiatry this is done via biopsychosocial approach. When we talk about biological I mean um, in terms of medications psychological it refers to talking therapies which are very useful in helping patients with schizophrenia as well as social, which refers to increasing the level of support around the patient 
so that they can fulfill their potential in the best way. So first of all, antipsychotics. These are the mainstay of medications in schizophrenia. They tend to work by reducing the levels of dopamine in the brain, um, as I've already alluded to. They're older and newer tablets, and often it's, it, this would involve a discussion between the patient and their psychiatrist regarding which tablet works best for them. Then the, I'd like to talk now about the psychosocial elements, the psycho psychological supports and the social supports, which are also incredibly important in schizophrenia. Um, in terms of psychological therapies, cognitive behavioural therapy is available, as well as certain therapies like family therapy or art therapy. It's also really important that there's a good social structure around the patient. And this is where social supports come in, such as day centres, rehabilitation programmes, social skills training, employment training, all of which are really important in helping the person with schizophrenia stay well in the long term. Now I'd like to talk about the outlook, the prognosis in schizophrenia which on the whole is really positive. Out of five people with schizophrenia, one of them will get better within the first five years of their first obvious symptoms. Three of them will get better, but will have time when they relapse. And one out of the five will have troublesome symptom symptoms that persist for longer periods of time. But on the whole, people do respond to treatments um, which work best when they're all done in combination. So medications, as well as the psychological help and the so social support, all really important. So in conclusion, what have we covered today? We've talked about what schizophrenia is, we've talked about the positive symptoms, delusions, hallucinations, we've talked about the negative symptoms, apathy, reduced self-care, and so on. We've talked about what causes schizophrenia, so we've, and there we focused on um, genetic factors, we've focused on developmental factors, as well as how the brain itself is, um, can have certain abnormalities in these patients, and how it communicates within itself. We've talked about life stressors and life events and drug misuse in particular. Then we moved on to talking about the diagnosis of the condition and its treatment in a biopsychosocial approach, as well as the really positive outlook that a lot of patients can expect in this condition and how a person with schizophrenia stays well. So just one final point to make. Um, I really enjoy working with patients with schizophrenia um, because it combines the latest cutting edge research in neuroscience and um, scientific research into the brain um, and you apply that knowledge on a very personal and human level and I really enjoy the marriage between those two things. The human brain is incredibly complex, there are more connections within the human brain than there are stars in the Milky Way. So it's fascinating to be able to take all of that scientific research and apply it in a genuine way and to really see people making a really good recovery. So thank you very much for listening.